Great. Um, Sir Richard Branson, um, so uh, uh, if you could tell my readers, you know, why you got involved in launching the Carbon War Room. Um, why did we get involved in <laughs> launching the Carbon War Room? Um, I, I think it was a, basically a feeling that um, there were lots of people with lots of great ideas to tackle carbon, um, uh, but there was no, no, no sort of centre of coordination. Um, so, uh, and there were some industries that were better at doing it than others. Um, and you know, so you know, the idea of the carbon war room was that you know, if, if, you've, if you've got a war, and some people argue that um, the threat of carbon is as bad as World War I and World War II put together, um, you need a sort of central command center where, where uh, all the best practices, all the best ideas can be coordinated. Um, and uh, so the Carbon War Room's you know, first task is to, uh, to look at industry by industry and see where the low-hanging fruit are. Um, and, um, for instance, the shipping industry, um, uh, it hadn't got its act together particularly well as far as um, addressing, um, ad ad addressing carbon. Uh, the shipping industry as a whole is equivalent to the sort of sixth biggest country in the world. The kind of shit it puts out is, is particularly bad. Um, and therefore, um, you know, by uh, getting in there and working with the shipping industry, the carbon war has already, I think, had um, some considerable success. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, really, between the carbon war and the shipping industry, uh, the shipping industry can, can actually transform itself and, and most likely save itself a lot of money as well. Um, uh, cities, and I, I attended a you know conference at Vancouver uh, with you know the New York City, London City, uh, you know about thirty or forty cities, and uh, again lots of great ideas from individual cities, some far better than others. Uh, but by using the Carbon War Room to coordinate, um, for them to come and listen to each other, to you know uh, to get best practices from each other, uh, for the Carbon War Room maybe to help with with financing, you know some of the major projects that they're doing, um, you know, cities, cities can make a, an, an enormous difference. Um, the airline industry, obviously an industry I know well, um, again, a lot of work to be done and, and the Carbon War Room is, you know, is, go is going to be working on that industry. Um, can you give me a couple of ideas? I mean, I remember, I saw you in Time Magazine, you, you even referred to your own business as a dirty business. Uh, you know, what are some strategies for cleaning it up? Well, there, I mean, I think the airline industry moved moved maybe slightly earlier than some industries, um, and 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 you know, I think Virgin can take you know some credit for that, just simply because I got interested in this perhaps um, uh, you know early on, um, and but there's you know there's obviously a lot further to go. I mean, um, you know, for instance, you know, um, you know, two or three years ago, we look we looked into. You know, can we tow the planes to and from the end of the runways, um, which would save you know something like you know twelve percent of all all you know fuel 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 that's used, um, and uh, and it looked hopeful. Um, we did tests on on our planes, and we found that the strain on the front wheel was such that um, that the straightforward towing was not going to work, and therefore we're working with Boeing and Airbus <coughs> to see whether they can actually. Uh, you know, put a little uh, electrical motor in the front uh, front wheel, um, so so that, that you know so that that can happen in the future. Um, we're we're working with the carbon war room in discussions with with air traffic control to see if the air traffic control can be better organised. Um, at the moment, you've got, for instance, in in Europe, something like thirty different air traffic con control operators, and therefore the planes end up. Going all over the place instead of just going straight from A to B, um, and, and you know, try, try, you know, trying to get that much better organised. Uh, we're working with air, air, aircraft manufacturers, Airbus and Boeing, and trying to get them to put more uh, carbon composite materials in the planes. Um, uh, the uh, new seven eight seven that has been delayed a bit, but that Boeing are coming out is, you know, has got quite a considerable amount of carbon composite in it. In an ideal world, we like the whole of the plane to be built with carbon composite material, um, and you know we think that you know that that's the way to go in the future. Um, so it's, it's these kinds of ideas that um, you know that we're working on. Um, 
you mentioned World War Two and War, World War One. Do you see this? Uh, do you see the fight against uh, global warming as, as sort of the equivalent of those wars? And and um, from everything I've read, uh, I, I, I'm I am concerned that um, that. That, that the world has a problem. Um, but even if the scientists are mistaken, um, and obviously there are global warming skeptics, um, uh, the, we, are, we are certainly facing dwindling, dwindling resources. Um, and I mean, we did a study recently which showed that the demand for fuel will exceed supply um, in about five years' time. The peak oil. Peak oil. Um, and, and, and that is assuming that China continues to, um, you know, to have a sort of 10, 10, 11 percent growth rate, and that India has an eight, nine percent growth rate. But if they, if that drops off, maybe it'll be a couple of years later, um, and, and that will have catastrophic consequences for us all because the fuel prices will, you know, could could easily go through two hundred dollars a barrel, um, and people could be just scrambling to get fuel. So. You know, for that reason alone, we need to, you know, to be spending enormous amounts of money um, developing new clean fuels like algae, um, and we need to be thinking of ways of conserving. Um, you know, we do, we do have willing resources. Um, you know, for for global warming skeptics, I think they would all agree that we don't want to be reliant on other people for our energy resources. Um, America is very reliant on o overseas countries for its. Uh, for, it, for its um, energy resources, uh, and, and Europe is very reliant on overseas countries for its energy resources. So, uh, you know, so whether or not you're a sceptic or not, um, it, 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 uh, we believe that the carbon war uh, has a need, whichever camp you're in. Let me ask one, one last completely different question. I saw in Time magazine uh, you asked about being dyslexic. Uh, um, I'd spent a lot of time working on communications, and, and you, I think, said that maybe you became a better communicator. Uh, I'd just be interested in your, your thoughts on communication, how one, how one uh, communicates better on this issue and, and, and what you've learned. Well, I think, I think being dyslexic uh, uh, means that you are unlikely, unlikely to use high <laughs> uh language uh, uh, because you most likely don't understand it yourself in the first place and therefore um, you, uh, I mean, the, the, the way a dyslexic speaks is uh, is to simplify matters, and, and therefore, um, and, and, and therefore, hopefully, uh, that you can sort of get get an audience on side perhaps more easily than if you're not dyslexic. Uh, so there are sometimes positive uh, positive things that come out of adversity. All right. Well, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you.